to get that knock on the door at two, three o'clock in the morning is never one that, it's never a good knock. Three police officers outside the door, you know, I immediately said, what's going on? Opened the door and I said, just please don't tell me something happened to one of my kids. Kia was standing there and she just screamed, why would you say that? Like, what are you talking about? And sure enough, um, they were there to tell me that Miko had been shot and killed up here in uh, Columbia, Maryland. Uh, just a heartbreaking story there for Maryland football coach Mike Loxley. His son Miko suffered from bipolar disorder. And as we are now joined, as you can see, by Maryland Athletic Director Damon Evans of Maryland hosting Iowa tonight. And there's a huge matchup of unbeatens. I know you're really excited to have that game on campus, but there is more to it. This is a mental health awareness game uh, that Maryland is hosting here with Iowa. Damon, tell us a little bit uh, about how this came about. Well, you know what? We want to make sure that we bring awareness to something that's been plaguing our society for uh, as far as we can remember. Mental health is important to our student athletes, to the students across our campus and the people in general. So if we can do our part here at the University of, of Maryland by spreading awareness, discussing the issues and helping those out that suffer from this illness, uh, it's just a little bit. So I'm excited about the campaign that our staff has put together and we're kicking it off here tonight uh, with our game against the University of Iowa. I should also say that's uh, also of importance is the fact that and we'll be doing a PSA uh, with the University of Iowa that's going to air across uh, the state of Iowa and the state of Maryland. So we're very excited to co collaborate and partner with them. So you have the PSA in conjunction with Iowa. What else are you doing tonight specifically to draw attention to the issue and in the week to come? This is Mental Health Awareness Week throughout college football this coming week. Well, many of you may know that the green ribbon is a, a symbol of uh, mental health. You'll see on our helmets of our student athletes, they'll have the ribbon on their helmets. You'll also see on our goal post, you'll see the helmets. And then we'll continue to do, to do programming throughout the week. Uh, earlier, we did something on uh, Hear the Turtle podcast with some of our people across campus just to discuss some of the issues that continue to plague us from a mental health perspective. So that's been very good. But it's about education, bringing about awareness, and we'll do, uh, do that throughout the rest of the week. And again, this is something that is near and dear to the heart of Mike Loxley for reasons that we just heard about. How does he convey this issue to his team? It's interesting. Uh, Mike and, and his wife, Kia, are just tremendous individuals. With the loss of their son, uh, Miko, who, who dealt with uh, mental health issues, and it's just been remarkable the amount of energy and effort they put into bringing about awareness, but sharing the message with the student athletes in particular has been very, very strong on their part. Mike continues to be an advocate for this. And, and that's one of the many reasons what makes him so special to deal with such a traumatic situation, but to try to use that to help out others just uh, symbolizes who he and Kia are as people. Damon, what's the goal with student athletes? In other words, how do you know that you have succeeded with them? What's the message you're trying to get through to them on mental health awareness? You know, a lot of people look at mental health sometimes and they think it's taboo. They're scared to speak up. We want our student athletes to know that if you're suffering, speak up. We're here to help. We have programs in place for our student athletes, our staff, and our coaches. This illness is just like any other physical illness. We've got to take care of our mental just like we have to do our physical. So it's about bringing about awareness for student athletes, but making them feel comfortable uh, in their own skin to bring these things uh, to our attention so they can get the necessary help that they need. Switching gears somewhat, I know that Maryland's been very active in social justice issues as well. What's happening on campus right now on that front? Social justice has been plaguing or injustice has been plaguing our society uh, since we can remember. We talk about this pandemic of COVID. We've been dealing with this pandemic of social injustice for a number of years. But our student athletes have done a tremendous job in bringing about awareness. Uh, just last year, we put together a Volterp initiative to make sure that we get people out to the polls. But what they're doing more so than anything is just educating one another, uh, utilizing the resources that are on campus uh, for us, as well as we hired a, a, a senior 
Associate Athletic Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here that has really brought a lot of attention and helped us to better understand what we're dealing with. We needed an expert in this area, as well as partnering with the conference. The conference has a group. Uh, a coalition that's been great and we've been a big part of that. So we're going to continue to work in this area. This is an area in which we have a long, long ways to go, but it has to be a movement and not a moment. David, I do want to focus on the game just a little bit tonight because I know there is a ton of interest on campus and a lot of excitement. What does a spotlight game like this on a Friday night, this is far and away the biggest game going on in college football tonight. What can this mean to Maryland football? First and foremost, we appreciate the opportunity to be in a game of this magnitude, being a member of the Big Ten Conference. Mike Loxley and his staff have done a tremendous job in building us up to this point. We took care of business in the first four games. Now we're giving ourselves a great opportunity to make some noise in the world of college football. So Iowa is an outstanding opponent coming in here very talented, very fundamentally sound. Uh, but we just got to take care of our business. And if we do what we're capable of doing, we'll continue to move along uh, that line and trajectory that we want. So I'm excited for the opportunity. Why is Locke such a good fit at Maryland? Uh, he's from this area. Uh, Mike loves th this university. He loves the DMV. This is not a stepping stone for Loxley. This is where he wants to be. This is where his family wants to be. He feels comfortable in this environment, and he understands it better than any coach we could possibly have. So I am humbled and thrilled to have him as our coach. He's a great partner as we build this football program, and he understands this area, and he knows what it takes. What stands out to you about the job he's done to get you guys to this point? And, you know, I, I would say in those first couple of years, you had a few glimpses where you thought, okay, like that, that was a you know couple really good outings. Think about in that first year in particular against Syracuse, like, wow, that was really eye-opening, but didn't really sustain it. How has he gotten to the point now where it feels like it's sustainable? Wait, people always talk about locks from the perspective of recruiting. Let's go ahead and get that out the way. He's one of the best recruiters in the world. But I'll also say this. He's one of the best coaches in college football. He's put together a great staff. He's got a great offensive mind, but he allows his coaches to do their jobs. And he understands that you have to build a culture within the program. If you have a winning culture, then you have a chance to have great success. So we've dealt with some very uh, difficult times here. He's come in. He's uh, built a bond with the young men that represent this program and he's connected with the campus and the community. And he's such a connector that in and of itself has us headed in the right direction. You know, I'm gonna give you a moment to brag here. You've got <laughs> men's soccer playing great. You've got field hockey playing great. Volleyball pulled off maybe the biggest win in the history of the program last week. Give us a sense of what's going on on campus above and beyond football in the realm of athletics. Yes, I am going to brag. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> when I think about Maryland athletics, it, it's more than just about football. We talk about One Maryland, and you can see the shirt that I'm rocking here today, One Maryland. You see it in the background. It's all about everybody, the collective, all of our 20 sports programs coming together, all of our coaches, our staffs, our student athletes. And uh, when you look at what we're doing in the sport of volleyball, a great win last week against number two, Wisconsin. Our men's soccer team is ranked in the top 10 off to an incredible start with Sasha. Then you look at sports such as field hockey under uh, Missy. The list goes on and on for us. And I could not be more excited. And, and what Locks is doing with football. Maryland is rising everyone we're going to continue to put out uh teams and programs that our fans and constituents can be proud of and again as i always say i'm just fortunate to be in the position and work with all of these great people but david i know it's a huge night for maryland athletics and again i know this is a really important week on campus as well thanks for all that you are doing with this really important initiative glad we had a few minutes to talk to you about that and and everything going on in college park thanks david Thanks for having me. Tomorrow, the Nittany Lions ranked fourth nationally, and here is why. Uh, defensively, they're really good. Only Iowa has a longer streak of holding opponents to 24 or fewer points. Offensively, Sean Clifford leading a big play attack. Five completions of 50 yards or longer this season. Got the great wide receivers, Jahan Dotson, Parker Washington. 
Let's break these units down a little bit. We start with the offense. I think we all wish they were running it a little better, but still coming together pretty nicely overall. Yes, and I, I think it starts with Sean Clifford and what he's been able to do with that offense. He is confident right now, and I, I think that was going to be the biggest piece of it. And I walked away from the bus tour feeling like he wasn't fully confident yet in what they were doing, and now you can see that. And the reason why is because of the play calling with Yersich out there. And they've developed a really good system of allowing Sean Clifford to understand what he's supposed to do within that offense. When you talk to quarterbacks a lot of times, where the confusion happens and, and where the, the disconnect is, is that they don't truly understand the purpose for a play. But Sean Clifford believes that everything has a purpose, everything is done for a reason, and Yersich has given him those reasons why. And then you mentioned two guys in Jahan Dotson and Parker Washington who have just been really, really good. And I said this before Jerry you disagree with me but those are guys who can get behind any defense in the country and I believe that they can and you got to connect on the passes but they are guys who can take the top off and it's been really explosive now you look at their rushing attack you ask the question about do they maybe need to run the ball more can they get that better but the way that they're doing it right now has been really impressive I didn't disagree with you that they could get people behind the defense you said it's okay for a defense it's gonna happen and I say it should never happen. But anyway, aside from that, uh, the, the issue with the run game, you know, Mike Yersich now, he's got a couple games on tape, right? So now you start to defend him differently than you did going into the season because you've never seen him coach Sean Clifford. And so there's a little bit more of a book on it. I think back in the day, you'd say they're going to have to run the ball sooner or later. They don't really have to run the ball anymore in, in nowadays football. I think they have to threaten the defense with the run, but more so because they're going to defend the perimeter game that Mike Yersich used against Auburn. You know, he's not going to get away with putting trips into the boundary, trips to the field, and throwing the ball out there. Right? That was something they hadn't done a lot before that. So the run game will be interesting. It, it's going to be a function to let them continue to play the game in space. Is what it's going to do. How dominant they have to be in the run game, you know, I think they have to be efficient, not dominant. Uh, part of it is the offensive line has not been great. I mean, they're giving up the second helps. most tackles yeah. for loss per game yeah. of any team in the Big Ten. What about the other side, Brent Price defense? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, it starts with their, with their athleticism. I mean, they, they, they can really run. What, what Brent Price does really well is he pressures at the right time. He's been a defensive coordinator for a long time. He, he's, he's like an offensive play caller. I mean, he, he's just really good. He pressures with very athletic defense, but he never really puts – a lot of people on an island, if they can't handle it, he never exposes a certain part of the defense by, by bringing pressure in another part of the defense. He's just a real savvy defensive coordinator. And, and you could put them up against the Iowa and all the best defenses in the country. You know, you're splitting hairs when, when you go only the statistics. They actually run better than the Iowa defense. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether they're better head-to-head -head or not, it's hard to tell. But they're, they're really good and they're really well coached. I agree with that. And you talked about the athleticism. I think that's the new age of defense. And the way that they're built is really good. And we asked a question about this Penn State defense. Would they be able to hold up against some teams that had some guys who could do direct runs and they were going to try to challenge the interior of that defense? And we saw that against Auburn right. where they tried to challenge and we saw that obviously against Wisconsin and Penn State was able to hold up against it but where they have the edge is that athleticism on the second and third levels where you have teams that want to put balls on the edge and they want to challenge you with the width of the field as well as uh, vertically down the field they've got defensive backs who are like six foot tall six one six two and can run long arms where they can stand up and they can scratch their knee at the same time you've got linebackers who are uh, taller longer bodies not necessarily thicker bodies and those guys can get downhill but they can run and if you want to put them one-on-one -on -one with a tight end or even a wide receiver who's not the greatest athlete they can cover those guys and so I, I think that's the advantage there is they figured out ways to defend a team like Wisconsin, but they're built to defend teams like Ohio State in terms of the athleticism. They seem to have really good team chemistry, too. I mean, I think it, Iowa's the same way. I look at those two teams, and it looks like the team's really having fun. They're really together, and, and that, that's important. Yeah, no doubt, and to your point, turnovers forcing a ton of them. Uh, seven already this year, just nine all of last year. So, again, that's where that athleticism gets shown off, and if you challenge them deep, you're giving up the potential of, of someone picking one off because that secondary is out of this world. So a division battle there tomorrow as they take on Indiana. We've got another one in primetime in Lincoln, Nebraska, Northwestern. Nebraska coming off a loss despite, I mean, look at these numbers in the second half against Michigan State. Michigan State had 14 total yards 
in quarters three and four combined. 14. The, the Mitten State struggled a little oh, bit in the second, second half last were week. bad. <laughs> I still won both games, but uh, Huskers moved it great. They were done in by special teams, a couple of critical turnovers, one of which came in overtime. And, Jerry, let's go back to your how's it going. So they're under 500 through five games in consecutive years for the first time in 60 years, actually more than 60 years, where it's happened in back-to-back seasons. And so I ask you, How's it going in Lincoln? Okay, well, it starts with defense. It's going well on defense. And, we, again, we talked about this yesterday. They've shown steady improvement since Scott Frost has been there. 17 points per game, uh, you know, that's pretty good. Rushing, they're holding their opponents to 139 yards rushing. That's ahead of Ohio State's defense and Northwestern's defense. Total defense, 327 ahead of Indiana that we keep talking about how good they are. Michigan State, we talk about how good their defense is. Ohio State and Northwestern. So defensively, I, they are really solid and and they are good enough to, to be eligible for a bowl on defense by the end of the year. Offensively, you know, offensively is a little bit of a mixed bag. You look at the numbers, and the numbers are really good. They're third in total offense. The issue with their offense is that Adrian Martinez is too much of a part of it. If they could have a tailback presence, the, their offense would, would be so much better. Uh, how's it going? Before I get to the negative stuff, here's how I think it's going. You watch them play Oklahoma, they've made drastic improvement, no even, in, even in a loss. But here's the bad news. Kickoffs, they rank 13th in the conference. Kickoff return, 13th in the conference. Field goals, 14th in the conference. PAT, 14th. Punting, 14th. Punt return, 14th. Those are the rankings of, of their special teams. Penalties, they're, they have too many penalties. And then turnover margin, they're 11th in turnover margin, but they have lost five fumbles, which is more fumbles than anybody else. On, in the conference uh, has done. I'm going to show a tape tomorrow on tailgate looking at some of those things because I think they fix those things. They can be bowl eligible. Now, there's their schedule. You know, what jumps out at me is their crossovers, you know, and I think it jumped out at the yeah. Nebraska people as well. You know, Michigan and Ohio State, and they already played Michigan State. That's a tough draw crossover. It definitely is, and you talked about the special teams errors, and that is that is one thing that really just stands out to me, and I came from a program where the best players were on special teams units because the emphasis was that special teams will win or lose you a game in just about every single game and that is one thing that they could easily clean up and those are a lot of times they're just guys understanding where they need to be or guys who are invested in being good at special teams if if they can clean that singular thing up we're looking at this as maybe just a one loss team this year. And that's wild to say. They've made a lot of improvements. We talk about this defense all the time. They're a lot better. I think offensively, Martinez being the, the focal point is an issue. But he is a legitimate playmaker. He can make all of the plays. It's the literal fact that when you look at the special teams aspect of the team, they've given games away. And the reason they can improve the special teams, it's mostly judgment. It's, it's when to field the ball, when not to field the ball, where you are, and the penalties. And again, I'm going to show you this tomorrow. There's two just unnecessary penalties. You know, you've got a defensive lineman throwing a quarterback on the ground. The offensive you've, line, a bunch of false starts. False right? starts, yeah. takes no talent to stay on side, you know, all those things. So the, so the good news is you, you clean those things up and, you, you know, you have a good year. I'm Big Ten field hockey boasting six of the top eight teams in the country, including the only two remaining unbeatens, number one Iowa, number two Michigan, a Wolverines team which fell just short of winning the national title back in the spring. They're playing extremely well once again, and we are very pleased to be joined by the head coach of the Wolverines, Marsha Pankratz, who is in Ann Arbor. She is our big interview today. And, Coach, I know it's hard to top undefeated, so I think to a certain extent I might know the answer to this first question, but how would you assess the performance of your team to this point in the year, maybe relative to what you expected coming into this season? Well, certainly been really pleased with how things have been going so far. I mean, at the very beginning of the season, we had six to seven players out. Some of them were down at the Pan American Games down in Chile. And so uh, we finally have our full roster back. And hopefully we're going to be hitting on all cylinders here the next couple of weeks because we're going to have to. You know, the Big Ten is really extraordinarily talented and very strong. And uh, we're looking forward to the season. I mentioned you finished just short of winning the national championship last year, losing in overtime. How have you been able to carry forward the momentum from such a good year, which, again, it's not a year ago. I mean, we're talking just in the spring, and so a a much shorter calendar in terms of getting set for the next year. 
Yeah, it was really peculiar. Of course, we finished in May, and it didn't give the team a whole lot of recovery. But uh, we have most of our players back, and I know they're very hungry to uh, continue the success of last season. And, uh, you know, so far they're working hard, and they're talented. So we'll see. We'll see. It's a long season to go still. How much, though, is that a goal in getting back there, having been as close as you were a year ago? Is that something you discuss with them, that they discuss internally? Well, I'm not sure it's, you know, we obviously, I think they know they want to get back there and sure. they want to win another championship. But, um, you know, we try not to focus on the outcomes. You know, we're focusing on the process, like any good coach tells their team, right? But it's important to stay focused every day, work hard, try to get better, uh, try to learn and grow each practice and every week so that uh, hopefully the outcome will take care of itself. You have a great superstar in Hallie O'Neill. She opted to come back this year. And, of course, this is a theme throughout college athletics what does it mean to have an anchor like that on your team who, who could have left as a graduate but opted to come back and give it one more run yeah I mean Hallie's a really special player uh, she's played her entire career every game uh, she's extraordinarily talented she's smart uh, she's a great leader and captain and I couldn't have been more thrilled that she decided to come back for another season she anchors our defense and she organizes everything on corner attack and uh She's, she's like an, having another coach out on the field, and we're just really grateful she's out there and she's made a big difference. I mentioned you guys shooting to get back to that national championship game, and it's something you're familiar with. You won a national championship in 2001, and I know it's tough sometimes for people to compare teams. I'm not really asking you to do that, but are there characteristics in this team that you saw in that team? Well, you know, 20 years, the game's changed a lot. We've got self-start, and the play, the play might be faster today, but, you know, the, the 2001 team came back for Alumni Weekend last week, hence my froggy throat. But um, <laughs> they were saying, wow. You know, they were like, we wouldn't be able to keep up with the players today, and I'm not sure that's true. I think the rules have just changed. Uh, I think both teams are athletic. Both teams are fast, talented, and play together and really respect each other and, and have fun. So hopefully we can, you know... Um, do the best we can this season to to follow in their footsteps that is the last big 10 team to win a national championship now maryland has won one subsequent to that but not as a member of the big 10 I and mean, we saw how good this league is right now and again yeah. six of the top eight teams in the country it's really mind-boggling what would it mean yeah. for the big 10 to win one this year and obviously i know you want it to be you but for the league in general whoever it is whether it's michigan or someone else yeah, absolutely. I think our uh, conference is extraordinary. I respect all the coaches tremendously. Uh, you know, I am, I was a Hawkeye and uh, support, and a lot of the coaches were teammates of mine. So I think we've got a great camaraderie. We respect each other a lot, and we would love to be able to bring the championship back to the Big Ten. So if it's not us, I'm rooting for any of the other teams in the Big Ten for sure. You did mention your connection to Iowa. I want to leave you with this. You had such an amazing career there, and of course you've been associated with Michigan for, for your coaching career. And yet, you know, again, you have the connection of, of playing at Iowa and being such a great player. We've got that game coming up. I know it's still a couple weeks away and you've got a, a bunch of other games in between, but we have it here on the Big Ten Network. We're thrilled to have it. What's that like every year when you go up against a program that people who remember you as a player are still identify you closely with? It's a great game. I love the experience. Uh, I support the Hawkeyes. I feel like I'm a proud alum. And, uh, you know, it's certainly it's a great, a great battle. I respect Lisa and her program tremendously. And I love playing those guys. I think there's mutual respect. It's a great, clean, hard-fought match every time we play each other. And, um, you know, it, it couldn't be more healthy and exciting and great for field hockey in the Big Ten. Well, Marsha Pankratz, great to follow your team to this point in the year. Best of luck here going forward, and thanks for spending a few moments with us. Terrific. Thank you.